uh, a few uh, introductory words. Um, first of all, uh, this year, 2020, is the 100th anniversary of the opening of the Drake Observatory. It was founded by Dr. Morehouse as a research and education venue. Our speaker tonight, Herb Schwartz, is going to talk more about that because he is the expert on the subject. And uh, uh, also, it is another interesting anniversary. The event that we're having tonight started basically in 10, uh, 2010, 10 years ago, as the first event of uh, reading poetry under the stars. In 2011, we had the first guitar under the stars event with the participation of Paul Wilson, Michael Carey, and myself. And that year was also the founding year of the uh, Heart of Iowa Classical Guitar Society, which started participating in the event in uh, 2012 and has not stopped ever since. So we have a lot of things to celebrate. In fact, uh, this coming year is going to be the 10th anniversary of the foundation of the Guitar Society, and we're going to have several special events to celebrate. And uh, so let me tell you what we're going to do tonight. First of all, Herb Swartz has agreed to give us a presentation. Here he is. Uh, I will let him speak in a moment. The presentation will be uh, something like 45 to 50 minutes, and we're going to have some question and answer after that. Then at about eight o'clock, we're going to begin our guitar concert with participation of a very good guitarist from the Classical Guitar Association. So without further ado, uh, let us uh, hear Herb Swartz and his presentation about the observatory. Herb. Thanks a lot, Thank everybody. Appreciate that. Um, let me go ahead and get things uh, started here. Um, we have several, uh, you know, as, as Athens said, we have several uh, anniversaries uh, going on. For one thing, uh, it happens to be almost to the day, the eighth anniversary of the end of the world. Uh, which you remember happened uh, on December 21st, uh, 2012. Well, we seem to have come through that okay, but however, there is another end of the world coming up, uh, according to some. Now, we all know what happened in 2012. Uh, they, it was basically the end of the Mayan calendar, and according to... Uh, research, they found that the Mayan calendar just basically ran out of space. As a result, uh, the world uh, didn't quite end in 2012. However, on December 21st, 2020, uh, the world, according to some people, is going to end again uh, when uh, Jupiter and Saturn uh, happen to uh, coincide with each other. And uh, this will cause a gravitational effect, which will again will destroy the world, according to some people. Actually, it is just merely a great conjunction. It's actually the conjunction or the passing of Jupiter. Uh, right. Happens to be the passing of Jupiter in front of Saturn. And this is actually something that does not, is not a terrifically rare occasion. Uh, mathematically, it actually happens about every 20 years. It's just that this year they happen to be a little bit closer. Now, we all know that the planets go around the sun. Um, and we also know that as they go around the sun, they, the orbital plane or the path that all the planets follow happen to be a, uh, well, it's a fairly flat plane. Um, if you take a look at it from the side, you can see that Pluto seems to be the renegade. As a result, Pluto is no longer a planet. Uh, so uh, when we have the planets, you can see that Jupiter and Saturn are almost on the same plane. It's that difference between the plane of Jupiter and the, uh, and the plane of Saturn that actually keeps them separated. But they do approach each other 
And this particular year, uh, as they as Jupiter uh, basically moves in front of Saturn, they are particularly close. And in fact, to get them this close happens about every well, it happens about every three to four hundred years. So as a result, as they do go around, uh, Jupiter and Saturn will uh, move closer to each other. And as they do that, uh, they will get closer and closer to each other in the sky until on the 21st, uh, when they are approximately one tenth of a degree away from each other. What makes this really kind of neat is the fact that through a small telescope, they will actually be in the same field. But make no mistakes about it, Jupiter and Saturn are not close. In fact, the uh, Saturn is actually more than 400 million miles away from Jupiter, even at the closest. Now, there is another anniversary, this is the year of anniversaries. I guess it has to make up for all the other stuff that's happening this year. Anyway, but this summer is the 120th anniversary of the Waveland Golf Course. Now I know some of you are really into that and uh, it's a wonderful event. I understand that the grass is going to be green. Uh, people are going to be out there and uh, going to be a generally good time out there for the 120th summer of the golf season. Now, I don't know whose idea it was, or actually I do know, but it seems to be, you know, kind of a, a, well, you know, there's a, there's a problem out there. You see, in between the 11th and 18th fairway, there is this hazard. And this hazard has been there uh, coming up on 100 years. And I don't know whose idea it was to put that there, although I do have a fairly good idea. Uh, but the course is challenging enough. You know, it does have hills and, and valleys, and it makes it a little bit of a challenge to do this. Putting this, this hazard in the middle of the 18th fairway somehow seems counterproductive. Now, what was this, what's the story behind this thing that's out there? Well, for one thing, the Drake Observatory, as it came to pass, uh, the, the, uh, the roots of it can be traced back to a Civil War romance. So it's even older than that. And in 1863, George Carpenter married J. Henrietta Drake. And you're thinking, so what? Actually, that's a pretty, pretty important step. Because at the time, uh, Mr. Carpenter, I should say Professor Carpenter and Professor Drake both were instructors at Oskaloosa College, uh, which is not to be confused with William Penn College. Oskaloosa College was actually a training ground for Baptist ministers. Uh, Mr. Carp, I should say Professor Carpenter, was the chancellor of Oskaloosa College, and uh, Mrs. Carpenter was actually a professor of instrumental music. And you can say that uh, since they were married, they made beautiful music, to, and I won't even get into that. Anyway, but uh, Professor Carpenter knew, or such, I should say Chancellor Carpenter knew that Oskaloosa College was on very shaky ground. The average salary for a full professor 
at Oskaloosa College was actually less than that of a day worker, a, a laborer at the time, which was less than $300 a year. So uh, Chancellor Carpenter knew that he had to change things. He decided that he needed to move the college from Oskaloosa to the big city of Des Moines. And to do this, he needed money. And who better than to give money to this, this project was Mrs. Carpenter's brother. Um, Mrs. Carpenter's brother was actually General Francis Marion Drake, a Civil War hero who was also a very astute businessman and managed to amass a pretty fair fortune in his time. He pledged at least $20,000 toward the formation of a college in Des Moines, Iowa. And then when the college, uh, they, they finally put their articles of incorporation to Polk County, to Polk County in 1881, and with his $20,000, they were able to start the college. The first building that was constructed, that actually they started construction on, was the Old Main. This was started in 1881, and the estimated building cost of $30,000 was actually put up, at least two thirds of it was put up once again by, by General Francis Marion Drake. The building was completed and dedicated in 1883, but it was not the first building on campus. This was, this is actually the student's building and this was completed the first summer of 1881. It was a four-story structure. It had 42 rooms on it, including dorms, labs, classrooms, and a kitchen, and a furnace room that was missing a furnace, at least for the first winter, which made things uh, a little bit cold. Um, anyway, but the, this building stood on campus for almost 20 years when it was knocked down around uh, the turn of the century and Howard Hall was built in its place. The, actually the second building that was built on campus was the science building. Uh, this was uh, completed in, uh, 1893. It was located with Old Main on University Avenue, and it actually had an observatory on there. And one of the things that was donated to the college by, again, General Drake was a telescope. Uh, General Drake was an amateur astronomer, and he decided he was going to give to this new university a telescope that was capable of doing research. And so they built very hurriedly this observatory that became part of the science hall. Unfortunately, they really didn't do a good job in building it because the trolley, which was located on University Avenue, every time it, it, it passed the old science hall, uh, everything would shake. As a result, any kind of observing would have to be done in between the appearance of this trolley. At about the same time all this was happening, uh, way up in a uh, county in uh, Blue Earth County, up in Minnesota, 
we have the education of one Daniel Walter Morehouse. Daniel Morehouse was, oh, was born uh, in 1876. He was born in a log cabin. And just the fact that he was born in a log cabin meant that he had 10 miles to walk to school both ways uphill during a perpetual snowstorm. That's not true. Actually, uh, Dr. Morehouse, actually, as he became Dr. Morehouse, uh, was a very good student. He had an open mind and an engaging personality. He actually uh, went to college uh, for a couple of years up in around uh, Mankato, uh, Minnesota, uh, where he got uh, an associate's degree. And um, he decided that he wanted to expand his knowledge a great deal. And he decided he was going to come to the brand new university that was in Des Moines, Iowa. This particular log cabin, by the way, uh, was owned by uh, Laura Engels Wilder. And it's probably pretty close to what Dr. Morehouse lived in. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that he was backward, not by any means, but it did, did show some of the frontier, uh, shall we say, the frontier background that Dr. Morehouse had. Uh, Daniel Morehouse's father was a veteran of the Civil War. Uh, he was uh, injured during one of the battles and actually had a monthly stipend of $4, which is about $80 a month now. He was a, uh, a homestead farmer up in South Dakota before South Dakota even became a state. And it was this, this frontier, this pioneer background that uh, Daniel Morehouse was exposed to. And he became, he was like a sponge. He just absorbed everything. And his frontier uh, uh, background uh, gave him not only the, uh, the flexible mind, but also he was a terrific athlete. He was on the football team. Uh, he was on the baseball team. Uh, during, in order to get money for his education, he actually uh, uh, worked at the downtown uh, department store uh, that was known as Yonkers. He worked in the men's department. Uh, students who worked with him, who knew him, called him very dapper, right up to date as far as the fashions were concerned. And it was Morehouse, uh, with his classical education, and I mean classical meaning that he was actually taught Latin and Greek, uh, and also the basics. He was a student of Shakespeare. He, again, his knowledge was tremendous. Uh, he was like a, like a sponge absorbing all of the education he possibly can before he came down to Drake. And it was shortly after he came to Drake that one of his roommates uh, had a neighbor who had a problem. And the problem was she had a textbook that was written in Latin. And his roommate asked him, could he please translate this astronomy textbook for his neighbor? Now, Daniel Morehouse, being a classical student, knew how to translate books. Uh, he was fairly adept at it. So when he got into the astronomy uh, textbook, uh, not only was he able to translate it, but his interest in, his, in astronomy just 
soared. He decided that science was going to be his background. So he decided he was going to spend as much time as he could in the new science building that was just down the street from Old Main. Uh, he took courses, and this is, a, I don't know how they got it, but that's Dr. Morehouse right there. And uh, he, was, he took as many labs, as many physics courses as the college offered. But once again, the most frustrating thing about all this was the fact that every time he went up to do any kind of observing, at the, the telescope that was on top of the science hall, the trolley would come and the building would shake. And he decided at that point, he was going to do better, better with that problem. He decided, he actually, he graduated from Drake in 1900. And at this point, things were moving very quickly in astronomy. At that time, Jupiter, they only found four moons going around Jupiter, but they were discovering new moons almost every year. By 1892, a fifth moon was discovered. A sixth moon was discovered in, 18, in 1904. And in 1905, a seventh moon was discovered. It was then that Morehouse decided he's going to get his doctorate. And his thesis is going to be on the physical characteristics of the seventh moon of Jupiter. We know that moon today as Ilara. At the time, it was just called Jupiter 7. And he, but he decided he was going to watch Ilara and figure out its orbit and it's uh, any kind of physical attributes that this particular uh, moon of Jupiter was uh, showing. The telescope he used for that was the uh, newly opened uh, Yerkes Observatory up in uh, Wisconsin. Now, in reality, Jupiter actually has more than 60 moons going around it. And the best picture we have of the Lyra is it's actually this one. So uh, you can see that he definitely had his work cut out for them. So using the 40 inch refractor uh, at Yerkes Observatory, he was going to learn everything he can about this new world. While he was up there on September 1st, 1908, uh, Morehouse happened to be at the right place at the right time because in the sky was a comet. And Morehouse was the first one to see it. As a result, this is known as Morehouse's Comet. And when he discovered that, he actually came back to Des Moines, and in spite of the trolley problems, in spite of all the, the problems of dust and dirt in the air, he took many pictures of this particular comet and even tried to work out its orbit. What he did discover was the fact that it didn't have an orbit. It was actually an, a, a hyperbole. In other words, it was just a curved path around the sun. It came in from beyond our solar system, and it went out beyond our solar system. So as a result, uh, this Morehouse's comet was never going to be seen again. Anyway, Morehouse became Mr. Comet. He gave lectures on the comet uh, all over the Midwest. Here you can see one that was given at the First Baptist Church. And as you can see, he charged 15 cents a person 
That translates to about $4 a person now. In 1914, he was able to defend his thesis on Alara and got his doctorate from the University of California. His enthusiasm for astronomy was, was tremendous. He would act during half times at night football games. He would actually turn out the lights and have star identification using the spotlights from the theater department. And here you can see one, one picture of that. He was still the athlete, though. He still got out to the newly formed uh, golf course on the west side of town known as Waveland. And he really enjoyed playing golf on Waveland Golf Course. He especially liked the rolling hills, the rolling landscape of this golf course, which is far from being flat. Any of you that have gone sledding down some of the hills of Waveland uh, certainly remember that. Uh, Anyway, he was especially attracted to a particular, particular rise uh, right around, oh, just a little bit off the, uh, the west, the, um, I'm sorry, the western edge of Observatory Road. There was an old windmill on top of that uh, rise, and somehow he imagined that they would look an awful lot better if there was an observatory up there. So he put together a plan to build an observatory on this particular hill. Uh, in order to do that, not only did he have to raise money, but he had to convince the city of Des Moines to help take care of it. So, so as a result, he made some concessions, at least you can think of them as concessions, to the city of Des Moines. For one thing, he actually had, well, as you can see, there's a, on the left side of this picture, there is the word woman. And if you were to follow that, it would go right there. What is that? Actually, there is a restroom access outside of the building that would take you to the restroom on the inside. This was a great place to actually have a bathroom. And so as a result, uh, people would actually be able to walk down the stairs, go into the bathroom and uh, use the facilities in there. And there's one on each side of the building, one for men and one for women. Not only that, but as you can see, there is an assembly room there, it's a classroom of sorts. And according to uh, uh, Dr. Morehouse's notes, that room should hold 150 people. Now, if, if you have been in that room, you will know that for that room to hold 150 people, they would have to be half-sized uh, because I think the limit for that particular room is about 75. But uh, Dr. Morehouse uh, was known for his slight embellishments and uh, this actually helped him out through the years because as you can see, the, the uh, uh, Dr. Morehouse had this vision of the observatory and as a research grade instrument and as a local timekeeper, this is known as the transit room. And this was a room that was designed to look at the stars as they passed the high point or the meridian of the sky. When a star does that, it actually gives you the sidereal, sidereal time uh, of that particular uh, location. So 
Dr. Morehouse saw this as a timekeeper, uh, possibly to give the railroad downtown the exact time. Basically, you would look through a telescope, uh, through a reticle, and as time would go on, a star would get to the middle point, at which point you would press a telegraph key that would put a tick mark on a recording chronograph, not only in the observatory, but in the train station downtown. So this was an integral part of the observatory. So the observatory was a feature of Des Moines uh, since November of 1921. On November uh, 5th, 1921, it was dedicated and uh, a big ceremony was held and uh, observations and the public was invited to participate since then. Now, the reason that Morehouse built it was not only to provide a research grade observatory to Drake University, but it was actually in the charter that they would give uh, weekly or biweekly lectures to the general public for no fee. As a result, you know, literally thousands of people uh, a year took uh, took part in these, and as a, and as a result, uh, the people of Des Moines actually got uh, a research grade telescope at their disposal to show that this telescope was at the forefront of research. A picture of Pluto was taken on November 21st, 1930, months after it was first discovered by Clyde Tombay using a telescope much larger than the one at Drake. So we have a telescope sitting in the middle of a golf course, an open field away from noise, dust, and the city lights. But uh, it certainly wasn't golf ball proof. The dome shows the results of getting hit by numerous golf balls. Uh, most of it accidentally, some of it by fairly irate people who didn't like that hazard sitting in the middle of the field. We are possibly the only observatory that has bullet-resistant windows, again, for the same reason. Anyway, with the observatory built and dedicated in 1921, Sage Hall, which was, as it was now called, was actually raised in 1949. Uh, all of the materials were put into storage for a year until they built Harvey Ingham Hall about a year later. And with the destruction of, of uh, Sage Hall, the observatory kept its promise. Uh, lectures were given weekly. And for the last hundred years, the observatory has been an ongoing uh, place to share ideas in astronomy. Now we have even more things to see at the observatory. With the advancement of telescopes, uh, we're able to provide not just one telescope, but actually as many as four or sometimes five telescopes that are open to the public. Unfortunately, Dr. Morehouse did not live to see how the observatory had evolved. Dr. Morehouse died in 1941. 
He was only 64 years old, 65 years old. People claimed that he just simply wore out. He was so enthusiastic that he just basically burned out. As his, at his request, he was buried in the wall of his beloved observatory, along with his wife. And these are the plaques that are on the wall. As you can see, he was president of Drake from 1923 to 1941. Uh, his wife died 24 years, 24 years later, 23 years later. So she got to see some of the things that were going on. And Drake, as you can see, was dedicated to bringing to the people the beauty and dignity of astronomy. It's still there, sitting on a rise uh, on the 18th fairway. And we are still, we're opening it up as we can every Friday evenings, unfortunately not this year with the uh, pandemic, but I'm looking forward to doing it, uh, getting the place open. Hopefully, uh, it probably won't open this spring, but I can, I'm looking forward to it opening next fall. We still have volunteers and Drake students coming in to give, uh, to actually help out with the programs and give the people a real good uh, background of what astronomy is like. We have hundreds. In fact, we get about, oh, somewhere between 27, uh, 2,700 and 3,000 people a year going through the observatory. And that doesn't include the classes and special projects that are ongoing at the observatory. But the main thing are the students that help out. We have math students, we have physics students, astronomy students, uh, all helping out and giving the public really a great time. This particular student came from Malaysia. And when she went back to Malaysia, the astronomy uh, society, the Des Moines Astronomical Society actually gave her a telescope. And the, in a vote taken at the observatory, it was decided that it would be a great idea to have not only a fall, summer, and a spring session, but it would be great to have a winter session as well. You can see the, uh, the uh, observatory site up there to see the programs. Uh, that are coming up in the future. Drake.edu Observatory for Public Nights. And you can see what's coming up in the future. As I mentioned before, the observatory does an awful lot more than just astronomy. Uh, just, you know that tonight is a perfect example of that because we have ongoing programs uh, not only in astronomy, but also in classical guitar. I don't quite know who that is, but, uh, well, he's probably somebody important. Anyway, uh, one of the mysteries that uh, is still at the observatory is this mosaic that's on the floor. Uh, when Dr. Morehouse had the observatory built, he put this in, actually it was people who installed it at his specific direction. This is a date uh, given by the, the position of the planets. And I spent uh, several weeks trying to, to decipher it. And the best I can determine was this is literally the cornerstone of the observatory because the date that this shows is October the 
the last week or two in October of 1920, when ground was broken to build the observatory. So the observatory right now uh, is coming up to its 100th anniversary of its dedication, which was November 5th, 1921. And I hope we can all celebrate that actually at the observatory. I am in the start, I'm starting to plan a huge party, um, if I'm allowed. So if you'd like to keep the dream alive, you can help out. And hopefully we can uh, have another 100 years uh, at the observatory. Okay, so I'm going to turn this back over to Athen and... Uh, he could talk more about this. Thank you very much for your, for, for your listening. Herb, thank you very much. That was not just an interesting presentation, but for me in particular, it's very touching because uh, as a professor of physics, I have uh, followed Moore, Moorehouse steps. And in fact, I held the same position as uh, chair of the physics department for six years. So it is particularly important to me to know this history, which I hope can continue for many, many years. We'll have a few minutes before our concert starts. So if anybody wants to ask a question, please uh, unmute and go ahead. I think I put him to sleep. <laughs> no, I think everybody's uh, shy, but don't be shy. Uh -huh. This is, Herb doesn't bite. He's a very nice guy, I promise you that. Hey, this, this is Dave Reynolds. I have a question. Hey, um, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, is it Dr. Schwartz? Um, actually, it's it's Mr. Mr., okay. <laughs> well, you, you fooled me. Um, just a, and this is uh, just a question I'm curious about, uh, and it has to do with Jupiter. Is it is it true that Jupiter helps to protect the Earth by... Uh, deflecting a lot of the uh, asteroids and uh, material in space away from Earth with its uh, gravitational pull? Well, actually, uh, the, the gravity of Jupiter is really kind of a two-edged sword. Um, yes and yes, um, it does uh, help deflect but also uh, some people feel that it may have actually contributed to the formation of the moon. Of course, the moon actually hit the earth uh, in the process of being actually another planet hit the earth in the process of forming the moon. Um, it may have contributed to the formation or the, uh, the, uh, of the, the two moons of Mars. Uh, also, when the uh, uh, solar system was forming, uh, because of the immense gravity of Jupiter, it may have actually taken away some of the mass that was to be part of the Earth. Because in looking at other, uh, shall we say, other Earths uh, with the uh, Kepler mission, they found that most of the planets that they had discovered that are similar to the Earth are actually what they call super Earths that are actually one and a half to twice the mass of our Earth. So our Earth with its particular uh, size and mass is fairly, uh, fairly uncommon uh, when you start comparing it to other solar systems. So, so I, I think you can call Jupiter a, a two-edged sword on that. And there are not a whole lot of uh, solar systems that have Jupiter-like planets going around them. So we can safely say the Earth is not flat? Uh, that's what I've heard. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks for the question, Dave. Uh, does anybody else wants to ask a question? We have something like five or six minutes left. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead, Joyce. Un unmute yourself. Joyce, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. Go. Yep. We're very interested in what you said about the Des Moines Astronomical Society presenting a telescope to a scholar uh, from, I believe, Africa or... It was Malaysia. Malaysia. Yeah. Yeah, Mal yeah. Could you tell me more about that? Because we're missing some of our 50 years of newsletters and that escaped us. Actually, it was David Lynch that did that. Oh, oh yes. And uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure if he did it as part of the observatory, but he... Um, uh, she was such a great uh, help uh, during the observatory nights uh, mm -hmm. that that you know you know Dave has a collection of, of, of telescopes and just gave her one. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We'll ask Dave. Okay. I might add something. Uh, this particular student was uh, her name was Sabrina. She was my student. Uh, she worked with me on a research project, and she did quite good work. She presented at conferences. But uh, now she's back to Malaysia, and she is uh, involved in some high-level education. So all these, uh, all these things that she learned at Drake and specifically at the observatory have been put to really good use. Do you have an idea of when that happened? Four years ago. I would like to again thank Herb very much for his wonderful presentation. It's always very inspiring and uh, very much to the point. Herb has the ability to make a complex subject understood even by people like me who don't know very much about astronomy. So that's uh, fantastic. Thank you again. And now we're going to get ready for our music program. So th here's how this is going to go. Every performer will... Uh, come online, uh, share the screen, and will actually describe what uh, uh, piece he's going to play or what video he's going to show uh, because, you know, we left it uh, to a very free and uh, hopefully welcoming format. I hope you enjoy the show. It is always very nice. And uh, I believe our first performer for today is Tom Mayer. Am I right, Tom? I'm here, yes, you're okay, right. The, the stage is yours, go ahead. Okay. I'll unmute your, your uh, microphone so we can hear Tom play very nicely. Okay. Um, thank everyone for, for coming. And Herb, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, by way of introduction of my first piece, uh, I want to point to a several significant connections between astronomy and physics and classical guitar. Um, the first is uh, the father of one of the founders of astronomy, Galileo. His full name is Galileo Galilei. His father was Vincenzo Galilei, and he was one of the key figures in the transition from the Renaissance era to the Baroque. Um, and not only Vincent, uh, Galileo's father, but his brother, Michelangelo, uh, were composers. They both played the lute and you can still find their music today, more so Vincenzo than uh, uh, his son. Um, second person I just wanna mention in passing is uh, William Herscher, Herschel, Sir William Herschel, came to England as a musician but his passion was astronomy. Uh, he was a composer. And again, you can sometimes find his music, mainly symphonic music, but he did play guitar. Um, he became the Royal Astronomer to King George III. Uh, yeah, that King George III of uh, Revolutionary War fame. But uh, he was the person who discovered the first new planet since antiquity. That was the planet Uranus. And for that, he was knighted. He is Sir William Herschel. And uh, maybe sometime in the future, I can learn some of his music. It would be appropriate. The third one is by way of segue to 
actually several pieces. Uh, it's a contemporary American composer for classical guitar, a man named Andrew York, who has a passion for math and physics. If you go to his webpage, he's got a whole section devoted to what he calls his math musings. Um, some of it has even been publishable. It's not earth shattering or groundbreaking, but then uh, his uh, guitar compositions are. He's one of the best known of contemporary uh, composers. He was a founding member of the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet, which won a Grammy Award uh, while he was a member. He has since left them to pursue a solo career. So the, uh, I'm going to play one piece live and then take advantage of some things that Zoom can do that uh, we can't do in the observatory, and that is have a video presentation. So I have some pre-recorded presentations, one piece by Andrew York and then another uh, uh, 19th century, early 19th century piece. Uh, but uh, being able to present video as well as the music is one of the few benefits of what we're doing now. So the piece I will play or attempt, it's called Sherry's Waltz. It's part of a series of eight called Eight Discernments um, and by Andrew York. <laughs> Tom, uh, not very nice images, by the way. Uh, great pictures. Um, so uh, that was uh, our first uh, performance, but now we have, I believe, uh, Dave Reynolds in line to give uh, a guitar presentation. Dave, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Absolutely. I can hear and I can see you. It's all yours. All right. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank Athen for uh, hosting this event again. Uh, it's always been uh, fun to work with you. Um, thanks uh, also to uh, Herb Schwartz for your great presentation. I thought it was interesting, very interesting. And then thanks for all the uh, people who uh, tuned in tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I don't have a long presentation, but I do have a, a video of a performance uh, that I shot last weekend. Um, of three pieces. Um, the first is a, a prelude uh, uh, written for harpsichord by uh, J.S. Bach, uh, followed by two more contemporary pieces, uh, one by Benjamin Verdery, a, sh a short piece that will lead into uh, a Leo Brower uh, a composition uh, entitled uh, A Day in November. Um, so, I'm going to, hopefully the sound is good. Hey Dave. Uh, yes. Hey, this is Steven here. Hey, make sure when you, when you share, after you share your video, there's an option to share your computer sound also. Um, make sure you select that. Okay. Um, share sound. Okay. It's uh, the left hand button of the yes. share screen. Okay. Got it. Okay, can everybody see me sitting there? <laughs> That's fine, go ahead. Okay, 
I'm going to play this. If you can't hear it or if we're having problems, um, speak up and we'll try and fix it. Hopefully it'll, it'll uh, work out. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, David. That was beautiful. So I believe our next performer is uh, Stephen Kennedy. Is that correct? I think so. so. All right, Stephen, the stage is yours. I'll give you just a second here. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, I'm the president of the Heart of Iowa Classical Guitar Society. Uh, my name is Stephen Kennedy. Um, yeah, this is definitely an event we always look forward to each year. So I'm glad that we can at least still do it online and, and uh, still share some music and, uh, and talk about uh, astronomy and, and, and the various things that uh, the Drake Physics and Astronomy Department deals with. So it's a fun event. Thanks for everybody for, for showing up. Um, before we start, and I, I know, Athen, you had said that you had shared it in the chat, and I'd already pulled it up, so I'm just going to go ahead and share it anyway here on my uh, in the chat room here. Um, so two links there, one to the Guitar Society page, and then I just put my own personal website link in, in there as well, in case anybody is interested in checking out any, any videos or anything like that. So uh, tonight I'm going to play, I believe, five pieces. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, a piece called Orlando Sleepeth by uh, English composer John Dowland. Uh, this was originally a piece written for the lute. Um, then I'm going to do two pieces from uh, the Suite El Recuerdo by uh, Argentine composer uh, Jose Luis Merlin, uh, the Evocacion and the Zamba. Then I will do uh, Ebony Samba by Brazilian composer Luis Bonfa. And then finally I'll close out with uh, uh, the second nocturne by uh, Johann Caspar Meritz. So hope you enjoy it and uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for tuning in tonight. Just doing a sound check here quickly. Okay. <clears throat>
This next piece is uh, The Ebony Saba by Lisa von Fleur. <laughs> Somebody muted me there. Uh, apparently, we have a little bit of a problem. Are you okay? Yeah. What happened? Uh, okay, there was an, an issue with the internet. Sorry. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, you can catch up. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll uh, let's pick it up where I left off there. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. And sorry about the interruption. Unfortunately, such things happen on Zoom, but thanks. It was very nice. Um, uh, again, we have all the information about the performers on in the chat room. And if anybody is interested, and if anybody wants some specific information about our guitar society, Stephen is the the person to go to. Okay. Well, thanks again. And I, I, uh, yes. I did have peace left. Oh, you have one more piece. Okay, sorry, go ahead, yeah. So yeah, the final piece here is uh, Nocturne uh, number no. two, opus number no. four uh, by the Hungarian composer Yo Johann Kasper Meritz. Uh, he lived in the first half of the 19th century and wrote a lot of really phenomenal music, uh, really uh, really technical stuff. This is uh, kind of an easier piece, I would say, and it's certainly um, just kind of a nice quaint piece. So I hope you enjoy it.
All right, thanks again, Stephen. And sorry about the interruption again. Um, thanks a lot. Well, it was very nice. So uh, before we go to our last performer, David Krabs, let me say that our guitarists may be available at the end if you want to chat with them. And anybody who wants to hang out for a little bit longer after the performance, you are more than welcome. So our final performer is David Krabs. He's the faculty of classical guitar at Drake University. So David, the screen is yours. Okay. Can you hear me okay? A little louder, please. Okay. Let me, let me adjust myself. I'll be ready in one second. Let me adjust that. How was that? Good. Okay. Okay, here we go. So, uh, is my video coming in okay? Can you see me? Okay, I'm going to play uh, uh, the two gavats from the Cello Suite 6 and um, a jig um, from the second lute suite all by Bach. And I'm doing this because I know Afton loves Bach.
David. Not only do I like Bach, but this last piece is my absolutely most favorite piece by Bach. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, 